Good morning. I want to thank you for being here today for Breaking the Silence, Sexual Trauma Awareness. We have um, several speakers lined up to share their stories today, and I want to just thank you so much for being here. I'm going to open this up in a word of prayer, and we'll get started. God, thank you so much for this opportunity to break the silence and shine your light into the darkness. I pray that you would be with each of us today, God, and just help us to see your truth and your hope and your healing. In your name we pray. Amen. Kate Selby, and I am the Sexual Assault Services Coordinator with the Durham Crisis Response Center. For over 31 years, Durham Crisis Response Center has been the standalone sexual and domestic violence agency in Durham, providing supportive services to survivors such as hospital accompaniment, counseling, support groups, and legal advocacy, as well as providing emergency shelter. DCRC also operates a 24-7 crisis line, both in English and Spanish. I've been doing this work for nearly six years, first in Washington, D.C. with the Rape Abuse Incest National Network, and now here in Durham. Before I get started, I'd like to remind you all that the content of today's presentations may be upsetting for all and possibly triggering for anyone who has experienced trauma. We all encourage everyone to take good care of themselves throughout today's seminar and don't be afraid to take breaks and walk out if you need to. The nature of this work and of this issue in itself is traumatizing, and we recognize that it can be tough to hear all this and process everything. I'll be at the DCRC table for the entirety of this event, and I'm happy to talk with anyone who needs to process their feelings, is feeling triggered, or simply just has questions about the scope of what's being relayed to you all today. So please, everyone, be mindful of your limits, and be sure to be gentle with yourself today, both during the presentations as well as afterwards. So a lot of you have heard the statistic one in four. According to the Department of Justice, one out of every four women will be the victim of sexual assault by the age of 18. For men, this number is one in six. Both of these statistics are staggering as well as very much minimized. We know that sexual assault is one of the most underreported crimes, and researchers typically agree that the numbers are much higher than these ratios dictate. Approximately every 98 seconds, another American is sexually assaulted, which means by the time I'm done with this sentence, another person will have been sexually assaulted in the United States. Only 344 of every 1,000 sexual assaults are reported to the police, which means about two out of every three go unreported. Why is sexual assault so dramatically underreported, especially compared to other violent crimes? When survivors were surveyed, they gave a variety of answers, including fear of retaliation, fear that police wouldn't do anything, belief that sexual assault was a personal and private matter, belief that what happened to them was not important enough to report or come forward, fear of getting their perpetrator in trouble, fear that the police wouldn't be able to do anything to help them, and most of all, fear that they wouldn't be believed. We as a society have this widespread misconception of what sexual violence looks like. We think of episodes of Law and Order Special Victims Unit, where a man in a mask is pulling a woman into a dark alley or breaking into her apartment or attacking with a deadly weapon. In reality, sexual violence committed by strangers is in the minority. And only about 11% of sexual assaults involve a weapon or really any force of any kind according to the Department of Justice National Crime Victimization Survey. Just this morning, I was on Facebook, and I saw a video perpetrating a lot of different rape myths and being shared like wildfire in the name of safety for women. You've likely seen a lot of these videos or lists that talk about self-reported rapists saying what they look for in women when they attack them, how they look for women with ponytails or long hair that they can grab into, or women with clothes that are easier to remove, Women who are distracted, looking through their purse, on their cell phone, seemingly easy for them to overpower. These posts talk about places women should be on guard or avoid because of how often they're abducted or attacked there. They talk about walking alone in garages, grocery store parking lots, bathrooms, etc. These posts go on to express ways women can keep themselves safe. The reality is that these posts are part of the problem and they propagate rape myths and false information more than they protect us from violence. 
These posts also completely ignore that sexual violence is perpetrated against males and gender non-conforming individuals. Approximately 72% of rapes. Some researchers, research, researchers report this percentage as high as 89% are committed by someone known to the victim, which means that their hairstyle, their clothing choice, their distractibility is irrelevant to protecting them. The video I saw this morning already had 125,000 views and was called Safety Tips for Women. While I agree that safety is important, and I think that we all agree that, these videos seem to put the onus on the victim and completely ignore the true dangers of where sexual violence is actually occurring. The picture of why victims do not report starts to become more complete when we think about who is actually perpetrating this violence. According to the Department of Justice, about 45% of assaults are committed by acquaintances. 25% are committed by former or current partners, and 1% are committed by a relative in those situations. Often victims question the assault and its label because of the relationship that they have or have had with the perpetrator, and many do not come forward because they don't want to get that person in trouble. Many victims report that when disclosing their assault by a known perpetrator, they are met with blame and disbelief. And we really wonder why more victims don't report, to bring this a little closer to home for us here, I can tell you that in 2013, there were 2,369 reported rapes in North Carolina alone, according to the FBI, and nearly 200 in Durham City in 2016, according to Durham City's crime statistics. One in five women in North Carolina have been sexually assaulted at some point in their lives, according to the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, and over 10,000 North Carolinians were affected by sexual violence in 2001 alone. And because we know that sexual assault is one of the most underreported crimes, those numbers are likely much, much higher than what I just told you. So let's take a step back for a second and let me define some of the terms I've used and that you'll likely be hearing a lot today. These, term, these terms often have different definitions in different states and by jurisdiction, but in North Carolina, first degree rape is considered vaginal intercourse by force and without consent, which I think you guys could understand just hearing that definition that leaves a lot of people out. And that's first degree. According to the FBI, rape is defined as penetration no matter how slight of the vagina or anus with any body part or object or oral penetration by a sex organ of another person without the consent of the victim. That's a much broader definition and that's the F what the FBI uses when they classify their reports. And you can see how different North Carolina's definition is from the FBI. We often use sexual assault as an umbrella term because it, the way we use it is including rape and also any type of sexual contact or behavior that occurs without the explicit consent of the recipient. So this includes forcible sodomy, child molestation, incest, fondling, and attempted rape or sexual assault as well. So now let's break things a bit down a bit further and discuss child sexual abuse. According to the Department of Health and Human Services Child Maltreatment Survey, about 63,000 reports of abuse against ch children are substantiated by protect child protective services per year. 63,000 children per year. And remember, this is the number of report reports they're able to substantiate or find evidence for. This is by no means all reports, nor does it consider as well the dramatic underreporting of child sexual abuse. In child sexual abuse, 93% of the perpetrators are known to the victim which again depicts a very different narrative, narrative than the majority of what we see dramatized on television and in movies. Once again, we see underreporting, often due to the nature of the relationship of the perpetrator to the victim, often not wanting to get the perpetrator in trouble because it's likely someone they care for and depend upon. We also see children put in positions where breaking their silence can cause a rift or even the complete breakdown of their family. Children are also often don't come forward because the perpetrator has told them not to, possibly threatened them, or even convinced them that their relationship is appropriate. So what is the aftermath for this trauma? What happens to the survivors? Studies are finding, including those done by the Department of Justice, that survivors are more likely to experience depressive thoughts and suicidal ideations. 
Survivors are more likely to abuse drugs to cope with these feelings. Survivors experience problems at work and often withdraw from those around them. Survivors are at risk of pregnancy and sexually transmitted infections. Survivors are in the aftermath, especially for children, we see uh, four times more likely to develop drug, drug abuse as a coping mechanism. We see them four times more likely to experience PTSD as adults. And they're three times more likely to experience a major depressive episode as an adult. And this is just for the children. The aftermath of trauma impacts every aspect of a survivor's life. And research dictates that their best hope for recovery relies on their supportive relationships. So hearing that they often withdraw from the people around them and they push people away tells us a lot about how their recovery can go. When survivors disclose their abuse, they need to be met with people who first and foremost believe them and have a positive and supportive interaction with them. When survivors who disclose are met with disbelief, shame, guilt, or questioning, the effects are detrimental on their recovery journey. This is the part where we can all make a difference, though. When someone discloses to us, we can start by believing them. And we can show them that they have support in us through their journey. What we ask you to do today and as you go out to your community is to help us dispel these myths by having these tough conversations with people and by promoting the truth about sexual violence and its prevalence in our community. Our mission is to help survivors understand that they are not alone and that we are here to support them. Thank you all so much for your time today. And now I'd like to open up the program to five wonderful speakers here to enlighten us and share their journey with us today. Stand Up Speak Out of North Carolina. Um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization that works with children and teens who witness domestic violence or sexual abuse. The uniqueness of our organization is that we utilize art therapy, poetry and journaling, music and dance in conjunction with traditional therapy. We believe that Stand Up Speak Out is that we can get counseling, children will go to counseling, but a lot of times they don't want to continue to repeat what they've experienced. So we use art, painting, and writing. Um, the passion behind this organization is my own story. So I am going to try to share that with you today. Let God use me to share my story and, and why I'm so passionate about this work. I'll start with first sharing how art therapy helped me. Too distant to be mentioned. Ripped into pieces of family secrets never to be broken. Hoping no after effects will affect her senses, but it did. After 26 years, hidden tears find their way to the surface. See, she had lost her courage because someone hurt her. Lapse of memory had her taken risk. Lapse of memory had her mind playing tricks, but no, she was starting to remember. The hit. The first time he tried to kiss her and she clenched. And the taste of leftover urine that made her feel like she would vomit. Droplets of premature ejaculation made her hate him. Conversations between God and the devil made her lose her salvation. Devastating. <clears throat> that someone who claimed to love her would make her a victim. Close kin. More like cousins. Sneaked in while family members sat at the dinner table reminiscing on the good old days. While children played in back room. They say, the little ones are so innocent. So they dropped their overprotectiveness. Had older siblings and cousins watch over them while they pretended to be grown up, but someone was a little too grown up in the game of house. Shh, don't be too loud. Don't ever let the secret come out, and it didn't. Held it in, never to bring it up again. 
Burn it and swept it in the crease of an abandoned room, never to be resumed. But soon visions were so vivid pictures of little children who would never fully bloom. Confused because their soul had been devoured. And now another innocent child has been devoured and mama's not paying attention. Too busy listening to the latest gossip coming from the church pulpit that she missed her daughter's cry for her attention. She didn't even know that her child's soul was missing. Wishing that mama would come to her rescue. But that child's 911 phone calls never got through. Line is disconnected. We're sorry. The number you call cannot be complete this time. Please check the number and dial your call again. And again, and again, and again she calls. But no one seems to recall the thousands of calls for help, the rebellious behavior, the suicide attempts, the running away from home, the skipping school, the unable to pay attention in school, the multiple sex partners. Did anyone bother take the time to pick the signs? No. They just brushed it off. Said this was just a phase that will soon fade away, so they took all of cooking oil and on her head and prayed. But soon after that, they lost their faith. Took her to unfamiliar counselors who thought they could make her break the silence. But no, she was too far gone now. She was violent, juvenile delinquent, all because her guardian angel, AKA her mother, didn't pay attention. She just didn't believe that someone snatched her precious seed, took her to the fourth floor on the elevator, and robbed her of her virginity. While she was in the same vicinity, speaking in tongues, giving God the glory. But no one wants me to remember this story. And no one really wants me to tell this testimony, but I have to. Because as you sit and listen to this poem, every second that goes by, a child is being abused. A son is left confused. A daughter is left internally bruised. And a mother is refusing the truth. This could be you. Your child might be screaming right now for you to come to her rescue. Don't disconnect it. Don't disconnect it. Don't press ignore on your cell phones because your child might be screaming for your help because she's afraid and alone. So answer that 911 phone call and dispatch yourself to your son's or daughter's location because your voice and your presence might just be their savior. I grew up in a two-parent home. My mother, an evangelist, my father, a deacon, my grandmother, the mother of the church, and every time the church doors were open, we were in church. So I know all about God. Mondays we were in church for something, and Tuesday we were in church, and Wednesday and probably Thursday I was doing choir rehearsal. All the time we were in church. Church is supposed to be safe. It's the place where no mother or father will feel like something terrible will happen to their child. So in July of 1992, when we attended a big church conference, seminar much like this, but a bigger, with national artists and vendors from all over, it wasn't out of the ordinary because we're in the house of the Lord, right? We were in the church. So when I asked my mother, can I go to the restroom, why would she feel any type of way of allowing me to go? I went and I went out with a friend who was 16 or 17, so she was supposed to be the chaperone. We're looking at vendor tables after we used the restroom, but we're kids, we don't want to sit in church. We've already been in there for hours already. I don't know if you know anything about Pentecostal churches, but they stay in church all the time. And so, as a kid, you get tired if you don't have no activities to engage you, right? So, um, we decided, okay, we're going to be out, we're looking at vendors and whatever, and I'm not far from where she's at. I decided to go sit down and play with, um, I think I had some, like, little toys of animal that I like playing with at a time. So I had it with me, and I'm sitting by the bench, and she is, can see me from where I'm at. Um, the elevator is here, and I hear people coming on and off. I'm not paying any attention to it, I'm 11. But what happened next changed the dynamics of my life. I was sitting by the elevator, not paying attention, she was talking to vendors, and I was grabbed and taken on the elevator. 
I was taken to the fourth floor in an open stairwell, and I was raped. What maybe only lasted just a few minutes was a lifetime for me, and it changed the dynamics of my life. From a two-parent home growing up with, in a healthy environment, I'd never seen abuse, I had never witnessed any abuse, father never yelled at mom, nothing to this nature, no one ever talked about abuse in any capacity. I was an A-B student, but this changed the dynamics of my entire journey. When it was over, he got up, went on about his business, and I was left there. It probably was just a few minutes when I got myself finally together and I went looking for my parents. I was taken to the hospital, made the report, but he was never captured. So the statistics that you saw are very real. They did everything that they needed to do at the hospital. They tried to, I guess, find this guy, but it didn't matter. I was tired of repeating my story to social workers and caseworkers and whatever. My parents took me to counseling. Counseling didn't work. It was a male counselor. Why in the world would I want to talk to him? So I didn't talk. Counseling after counseling session, I did not talk. And I ended up just shutting down. My life took a complete turn. For a year, I shut down. They sent me to counseling. They tried to get me mentors. They did everything that they could. But I didn't want to talk because I did not want to repeat. For me, at 11, I wanted it to go away. For a year, nothing. And then all of a sudden, I started getting in trouble in school. The AP student, grades became Ds and Fs. The student that grew up knowing that you respect your elders, you respect teachers, started cursing teachers out, fighting in school, running away, doing all types of things that I had never done before. I ran away from home. At 14, I looked 17, 18, and two things I tell people happen to a victim who's been abused. You either become promiscuous or you shut down. I needed something. And I felt like the only way to get it was through sex. And I began to become the promiscuous young girl. I was in my first abusive relationship at 14 with a guy who was 17 or 18. I was in my second abusive relationship at 17. You're looking at a woman who before she was even a woman, I've been choked till I was passed out. I've had black eyes. I've been hit with metal rails from the bed. I've been called all types of names, verbally abused, emotionally abused, psychologically abused. I am a survivor. What helped? I'm a writer. And through healing through arts, which is what my organization talks about, we focus on the healing aspect. I could not talk to a counselor. Maybe another victim can. can. For me, it was about writing. If you gave me a journal, if you gave me a pencil, I could tell you about that pain that I experienced. But I could not share that one-on-one. -on -one. I used writing as my outlet. And it was not until I was 19 or 20, while I was still in the, one of the last abusive relationship, I began to use that art to share. I went out and I shared a poem just like I shared with you this morning. And at that moment, so many women and so many survivors came to me saying, that is my story. Please keep sharing. For some reason, that gave me some form of hope. I did counseling. I did group therapy. Um, and I continue on what I like to share my story. Through sharing my story and through poetry, it helped me to heal. Even though I was going out speaking, nervous as I could be, I was sharing my story and helping other people, but I also was helping myself. Each and every time I shared over and over again, it was like the wounds on me, within me, were healing. That might not be your story. You might be nervous to get up and share, but maybe even just writing it might be an outlet for you. I believe in healing through the arts. 
I believe that that is what helped me to get to this place to be able to come and share. Was it a long journey? Absolutely. Am I completely, do I have it all together now? No, because there's still flashbacks. There's still dreams. There's still different things that, that survivors experience many years down the road. But that I'm a work in progress, and as I continue to work, and I continue to deal with the healing, which is a lifetime sometimes, I continue to share that we all have a space in this healing journey. As I move forward and get out of your way, I want to leave something with you. I'll be here tomorrow as well, more so sharing about the aftermath of abuse. I have a daughter from that abusive relationship, the second one. She's 18 now. But it was her that helped me to see that I did not want her to believe that it was okay for someone to abuse you. She had her own journey. And that's why I am so passionate about talking to children and working with children. Because we think that our children, oh, they, they're there when you're having arguments. They're there when there's you know, some type of abuse. Or they don't really know what's going on. But they do. And it affects them. And because I hadn't dealt with my own healing until I was way in my 20s, I brought all of that on in that parenting aspect as well. We cannot suppress the abuse. We cannot act like it did not happen. Because suppression, it will eventually, it will come back and it will rise. I want to encourage you that if you have experienced anything, sexual abuse, domestic violence, sexual assault in any capacity, that you talk to someone today. I don't care if it's been 30 years ago that you think, oh, well, it was 50 some years, 30 years ago, and it's over, and I just move on with my life. I promise you it's probably somewhere still there. Something happens in your space that keeps bringing it back. <laughs> Healing is beautiful. The breakthrough is awesome. And I encourage you to walk this path with us. Thank you for listening. this church for the first time. I sat in the very back row on that side, hungover and reeking of cigarettes. I remember looking around and thinking, I will never fit in here. I am not like these people. Every Sunday, I would leave during the invitation, and one of the ladies would chase me into the parking lot. Melissa! Melissa! And one day, when I was bolting out, she finally called up with me. And she said, Melissa, Melissa. And I stopped her and I said, my name is not Melissa. My name is Michelle. And she was like, oh, OK, Michelle. I just wanted to invite you to the beach this weekend for a retreat we're having with our college and career class. And I looked at her and I said, no, thank you. I didn't come here to make friends. Betty did not give up on me. She kept chasing me. She kept checking in with me, and eventually I went to her Friday night Bible study. God started to do a major work in my life, and he started to meet me in my sin. I started to go to church more and clubs less. I had a lot of sin to work through, and just when I felt like I had been completely forgiven, the enemy would throw it back in my face. I shared with Betty that I had sinned quite a bit, and she told me that God would forgive me as far as the east is from the west. I believed her, but I still felt like a bad girl. I had always felt like a bad girl, and I was desperately afraid of people finding out. So I cleaned up well, and over time, I fit in just fine. One weekend, I went with Betty and some of the other ladies from the church to a women's conference in Raleigh. It was my very first conference, and I was so excited. The speaker came out, and she was beautiful. 
She was dressed in all white, and her hair was pulled up, and she just looked like an angel. At the beginning, she made us laugh. But then she started to share her story. She mentioned briefly that she had been sexually abused as a child. My heart started pounding, and I was holding my breath. I had never heard anyone say the words sexual abuse or anything like it in church. I remember wondering, how in the world did she become an angel? I didn't tell Betty or anyone after that conference about how that speaker's story had affected me. I just tried to not think about it, and I stuffed my own story down even more. I sealed it up tight, and I just continued trying to be a good girl. I showed up, I signed up, I stayed busy, but I stayed distant. I didn't really connect deep with others. I didn't connect deep with God either. I had friends, but also had secrets, and I shared them with no one. I married Anthony, and then I was excited to find out that I was going to be a mom. Life looked great on the outside, but on the inside, I was still struggling a lot. I became a mom, and I was terrified because I knew the world was not safe for children and I didn't want mine to ever get hurt. I was going to do everything in my power to protect them. I didn't trust anyone, and I worried a lot. After we had our third child, life started to slow down a bit. As I was watching my kids grow, I would try to not think about what it was like for me when I was growing up. But five years ago, God started to shake things up for me through Zumba and the Break and Free Bible Study by Beth Moore. I remember one night when we were leaving, one of the ladies said to me jokingly, we often refer to you and Anthony as Mr. and Mrs. Crescent because you guys are so perfect and you have it all together. And I just stood there thinking, ouch, ouch, ouch. That one sentence struck something so deep in me that screamed, no. That is so not true. That statement took me back all the way to 1997 when I was sitting on the back row thinking, I will never fit in. And I realized how desperately I tried to be okay. I tried to fit in. I wanted to appear Christian, but I was not okay. I felt so broken. I was having flashbacks, nightmares, and I was crying often. I was tired of wearing the mask. I finally got desperate enough to schedule an appointment to meet with a Christian counselor. <clears throat> Even though I was paying her and she had assured me that it was confidential, it still took me three sessions. These sessions were 55 minutes long, by the way. Three sessions to say the words to her, I was sexually abused. I know firsthand how hard it is to get those words to come out of your mouth. I had always believed the world would blow up if I ever admitted it. But honestly, saying those four words out loud in a safe place was the beginning of my healing journey. And you know what? Nothing blew up. No one died. The police didn't come get me. I was believed. When I said those four, four words out loud, the light was now shining in the darkness. I continued to show up for those appointments every Thursday for over three years. It was a journey for me to discover the truth. And it's the truth that set me free. First, I had to admit what happened to me. I was sexually abused throughout my childhood. I had to acknowledge what happened. I had to say the words and work through the awful, painful memories and counseling. Eventually, I decided to tell my husband. I thought it was going to destroy our marriage, but it has only made it stronger. In counseling, I was also able to discover the truth about who I am. I'm not a bad girl. I'm not trash, and I'm not used goods. I'm a precious gift created by God for purpose. He's my king, my Abba Father, and that makes me his daughter, his princess. He delights in me. 
I also had to discover the truth about who God is. He did not create me to be abused, and he was never okay with it. He loves children, and they are a blessing. He even says in Matthew 18, 6, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. These strong words are in red, which means Jesus said them. As a church and as followers of Christ, we not only have to acknowledge this truth, but we have to respond to this truth. Listen, this is important. The trauma from sexual abuse causes a child to stumble. It affects their brain development, their relationships, their boundaries, and their emotional development. We all know the truth. Sexual abuse is wrong, it's harmful, it happens, and even more often than what's reported. So what are we going to do about it? The enemy, he's thrilled to let these secrets and shame thrive in the darkness. I sat in church all of my life, and no one ever said sexual abuse was wrong. I knew a lot about sin, but we didn't talk about this one. We did talk about purity, and I knew I was not pure, but I thought it was my fault. I thought I was all alone. I thought it was just me. It confused me about who God was and how God felt about me. I thought, as we sang, Jesus loves the little children of the world, but not me so much. Some girls were precious in his sight, but not me. Sexual abuse confused me about church in general and even the Bible. I saw and I read and I felt everything through the horrific filter of abuse. That was my reality and that filter distorts everything. If statistics are true, many of you in here today share history like mine. Someone violated you in the worst way. They took something very precious and innocent away from you. They abused their power and their trust for selfish gain, and you suffered tremendously. It was wrong, and you never deserved it. It was never your sin to carry. Jesus does not take lightly any sins committed against his children. So again, I ask you, what are we going to do about it? We can do something with this truth, it's not enough to know that sexual abuse is wrong. We have to talk about it and say the words, no matter how taboo, no matter how awkward or uncomfortable it may sound. Maybe like me at that conference years ago, today is the first time you've ever heard someone say childhood sexual abuse in church. Maybe your heart is pounding and you're holding your breath. I need you to look at me as if it's just the two of us in this room. Listen, I see you, I believe you, I know you're not alone, it's not just you, and it's not your fault. It was never your fault. The truth will set you free. There is hope, and it starts with breaking the silence and admitting the truth of what happened to you. We are praying that God will give you someone to share with so that your healing journey can begin by saying the words, I was sexually abused, I was raped, I was fill in the blank. You can join a Bible study and start discovering the truth about who God is and who God says you are. And learn more. We're gonna be offering a Bible study here in May. It'll be in person and we'll also be offering one online. It's called Journey to Heal and we'll talk more about that at the end. Maybe you're here today and you've never been sexually abused or violated, but you're seeing up close and personal that based on statistics, chances are it's happened to someone close to you. Maybe even someone you dearly love. What can you do? Learn more about it, talk about it, ask questions, pay attention, use your voice, sign up for the Darkness to Light training, get involved. 
Just being here today is huge. Keep showing up. Keep speaking up. In John 8, 32, Jesus said, Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth is, sexual abuse is devastating, and it affects so many people. We know the truth, and we know that it brings freedom. What can we do? What would Jesus do? We can break the silence and share the truth with others and bring his hope and his light into the darkness. Thank you. Hi, my name is Connie. Um, <clears throat> first few seconds, you'll probably notice I'm not a speaker, definitely not a writer, but um, I felt like God was asking me to give my testimony. I was sexually abused when I was a child, when I was 10, and um, it wasn't until my senior year, the beginning of my senior year in high school, that Child Protective Services came in the house and removed my sister and I. Um, before it could even go to court, my abuser decided the day before he was supposed to take a lie detector test that he would take his life. So all of our, our family and our whole life kind of blew up at one time. And part of me was like, well, I was still broken, but I didn't feel the need that I had to talk because I was like, he's gone, why, you know, get over it kind of thing. And, and I really didn't want to talk. And um, so I'd gone to Virginia Tech and I remember meeting this really cute guy named Skeets and I just felt like we were starting to get serious about dating and, and I was so afraid that he was going to say, well, tell me about your family. I was like, oh no, and he would probably leave. Um, but God gave me his grace and I sat there and I told him and opened up my heart and he was like, wow, let's pray. And um, that just blew my heart because I never had someone that treated me like that, let alone wanted to pray and say, I care for you. Let's see what God says about this. So basically, he was like, can you go home and, and, and try to resolve things with your mom? I was like, no, you don't know how to stand. I, I can't do that. And he kept saying, but, but God can help you do that. And, and he was right, and God has helped me to do that. Um, it's been hard, it's been difficult, and at the same time, I, we got married a few years later, and, and I felt like I, I was still having these issues in my life, and I was like, why are these things popping up? And it's because what's inside is going to come out until you talk about it. And it's kind of like a time bomb. It's going to come out one way or the other. And was I going to let it happen willingly, or was I just going to let it happen, like when I'm trying to discipline my kids and it comes out in anger, or, or any other obstacle that was going to come, I had to face it. So I started praying and asking God, and um, I remember going to different Bible studies and, and talking, and little by little, you know, we all have codes as, as kids that have been abused. You have like these little code words, just say a little bit, to give people a little bit of information to see how they're going to handle it before you're going to share anymore. So we have a whole lot of code, code language going on. And, and God started healing a lot through women's Bible studies. And, and little, just little by little, he was taking my heart and, and healing it. Well, then it came about nine years ago. We, um, Beth Moore, again, like Michelle said, there was a book called Breaking Free. And man, he broke some chains. And he was breaking me free. And I felt for the first time, like we had, um, with these ladies, we were able to share, just be transparent and real, my story. And, and it's like, wow, all the chains are falling down. I was like, wow, he's healing me, yay. And, and then God said, you know what? Let's go a little bit deeper. And I was like, oh, no, I don't know. I'm good. And he said, no, I, I, what I need you to do, or I want you to do, this is August. Well, actually, it was January, he told me, but I didn't listen until August. He said, I want you to write and come and meet with me. I'm like, well, I'm gonna write, I'm not a writer. And he's like, I just want you to meet with me. I want you to meet from August now until Christmas and just write whatever I tell you. And I'll, I'll open the first page because like I said, you'll, you'll realize I'm not a writer. But anyhow, yeah. Friday, August 29, 2008. Lord, I know that you've been preparing my heart for a long time to write my story. And I'm still not sure how it will come together. But I know you'll show me along the way. I believe you want me to write whatever you put on my heart each day of the memories of the past. I know I will write you each day until Christmas, and then you'll have my story. The story you created even before I was conceived. 
This will be my gift to you this Christmas. A book of my life. And how you have always been there for me. How you've always guided me and drawn me closer to you. I know the grammar will be a mess and my sentences will have little structure. I know you will read through the lines and you'll see my heart, just like you always have and always will. I know some days will be hard as I look back and see what you brought me through. I know it won't be easy and I might open some wounds, but I know you will help me. I can't do this on my own. I know that this morning when I tried to sit and mentally go through the highlights of my life with you, whew, it was exciting, sad, happy, and even, even fearful at times. I was amazed at how memory can take you back so quick to a place I tried so hard to run away from. How memory can make you cry tears one minute of hurt and then turn the tears of deep gratitude and a desire to be before you in your presence. Lord, please help me share all that you would have me share. You are my life. I'm nothing without you. It's only by your grace that I'm even here. I know your plans for, for me have always been for good. I know this because your word tells me and I believe you. But sometimes, Lord, I have struggled at times to see good. When at times I have felt pain and betrayal in my life, you have always been faithful to me. Thank you for loving me and being there when I so desperately needed you. For all the times you, pers you, pers you pursued me, when all I wanted to do was run the other way. I guess I better go to sleep. Lord, thank you for today. I love you, Connie. So for the next four months, he had me sit down. And every day I didn't know what I was going to write. And it was scary. And he, he told me, just write what I tell you. Just write whatever memory comes in your head. And I'm going to heal you. And by Christmas, you're going to be healed. And I claimed that verse. I just kept thinking, OK. And it was hard. There were nights I stayed up into the morning because I knew I had to write him. There are days that, that were crazy. Um, October 4th. The whole thing I'm trying to share with you is that, like you mentioned earlier, you gotta say it, you gotta share it, you gotta go through it, and it's gonna be hard. And writing this was a release for me. It was um, October 4th, and I had this fancy journal you all see I wrote on. I think I mostly put it in this so I could tear out a page if later I didn't want anyone to read it. But I didn't, I haven't. I actually wrote it four, uh, nine years ago. This, this past week was the first time I picked it up and read it again. So part of me is like, ooh, it's kind of crazy what I decided to do that, I don't know. But anyhow, this is what I wrote on one day to encourage you. <laughs> well, last night was hard. To go back and relive re all that happened is enough in itself. But to look at all the different aspects of what I lived through, not only the physical and emotional, but now even spiritual. Evaluating and confessing my heart on paper is the hardest thing I know the Lord has asked or even called me to do. Lord, I want to be obedient. But having to constantly face my past is taking its toil. So many times before I have dealt with my past with you. But it was in small quantities and for short periods of time. And now it's been every day for a month. I think about it all the time and I constantly have images running through my mind. I try to sort out the images and keep them in order. But when I try to organize my story, it causes me to linger in places that I, I honestly I'd rather stop visiting. But God, I know you have a purpose, and I've walked with you long enough to know you love me, and you are faithful. You know I'd struggle with all this. You knew it would be hard. God, help me. I can't do this without you. Draw me close to you and help me to empty myself and do the work you have called me to. Pour yourself into me. I need your strength and your power. I am weak. I can't go until. Wait. Lord, thank you. Even as I pour out my heart on paper, there it is. I am weak. When I am weak, you are strong. Okay, Lord, I have to go now and find that verse. And here it is, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. This is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, and in hardships, and persecutions, and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What a verse. God. Thank you for giving me encouragement. I needed you to help me, and you have. I know I'm weak, and I pray for your power. I read the rest of the verse, and I, and I can't even attempt to delight in weaknesses or, or delight in insults or hardships or, or persecutions or difficulties. It's hard for me to imagine delighting when I get caught up in the whining. Forgive me, Lord. 
I do delight in you, and your grace is sufficient for me. You have renewed my strength. Thank you for meeting with me and being so real and so close to me. I love you, Connie Sue. And the cool thing is, is that was like in the middle. I, I kind of wanted to see where, where in the world did, did it ever get easy? Was it always hard? Because obviously I hadn't read it since then. And, and he showed me that, yeah, it's going to get hard. When you start trying to deal with pain in your past, it is going to be hard. But by the time I read it, and I, finished, I actually finished um, Christmas Eve, which was kind of cool, because I just felt like, wow, that was, I felt like God just took this huge burden and it just rolled off my back. I mean, I struggled and tried to get healing little by little, and this was like, woo, she was like, we are getting rid of, we are getting rid of this. And, um, and he did. And, and that's my encouragement. I know I'm supposed to be short, and I'm not real short. I'm super this way. But um, <laughs> this is the verse I want to leave you. Have I not commanded you? Commanded. It wasn't a suggestion. He, he commanded us. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. And don't be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And I think that's the biggest gift he gave me was he made me look back to, to show me he was always there in every day, in every circumstance. And I encourage you to write your story. Make time to meet with him. He'll show up. Thank you. some because I'm identical to my mom, who uh, Becky Tenalia, who ran the preschool here for many years. Um, so if you're trying to figure that out, we'll just get that out of the way right now. <laughs> I'm not her, I wish I was her. Uh, um, so I run, uh, my name is Abby, and I run an anti-trafficking organization called Transforming Hope in Durham. Um, and our mission is to end human trafficking through education, prevention, and restoration. And so I was asked here today because if we're talking about sexual assault of any kind, especially childhood sexual assault, we have to talk about human trafficking. Um, I think, uh, I guess I'll explain where I'm coming from. When I first heard about human trafficking in 2010, it was a speaker who worked in Europe. And so that was my assumption, that human trafficking happens in other countries. There was no, there was not even a thought that crossed my mind that human trafficking could happen here in the U.S. or what that would look like or anything like that. It was just, it's happening over there, so let me pack up my daughter and figure out how we're going to go over there and fight this thing, because it's horrible and it needs to end. Um, but as I did my research and I, I looked into actually moving to Europe and fighting this thing, I realized that human trafficking actually is prevalent in America. Um, not only does America provide the highest demand, um, both in America and elsewhere through um, sex tourism, um, but we've got an estimated 100 to 300,000 children at risk of being trafficked every single day right here in America. Um, we, North Carolina consistently has ranked in the FBI's top 10 list of states most likely to have trafficking for at least the last seven years that Transforming Hope has been around. Um, the National Human Trafficking Hotline um, run by Polaris Project um, has, they received 27,000 calls in America in 2016 for, um, to help victims of human trafficking in America. The average age of entry into um, sex trafficking for a girl is 12 to 14 years old, and for a boy is 11 to 13. We've heard over and over and over um, by ex-traffickers, ex-buyers, that the younger the boy is, the more um, valuable he is to buyers. Um, Going through my statistics here. Seventy-five percent of predators who have been convicted of child abuse or sex trafficking um, have also reported being victims themselves. Uh, one in five homeless children are picked up in traffic within 48 hours. 
In America, there's 1.6 million youth between the ages of 15 to 24 that are homeless. In North Carolina, there are 2,542 homeless people. Um, and in Durham, according to Durham Public Schools, there were 846 homeless youth last school year. So one in five of them are picked up in traffic within 48 hours in our county. Um, as many as 40% of children who are sexually abused are abused by an older or more powerful child. Um, we've heard hundreds of stories at this point where it was an older child who recruited and or trafficked a younger child. Um, so they are participating in that way. Uh, and then 84% of sexual victimization of children under 12 occurs in a residence. So when we talk about human trafficking, even if people understand that it happens in America, we think, well, it's gotta be that woman walking the streets or in the strip club or um, what we think of may typically be prostitution or stripping. Um, but unfortunately, there are homes all over America that are being used as brothels, that are being used as places where children in America are, um, are lured into this life and brought to and sold over and over and over every single day. Um, reports in Wake County um, from victims who, or from survivors who have been helped um, say that they are servicing anywhere from 30 to 50 clients a day. Um, so this is, it's, it's horrific, but it's happening here. Um, it's when we work with children um, we see human trafficking or sex trafficking on this spectrum of it's a whole list of things that children are vulnerable to um, and sex trafficking is on that spectrum. Um, unfortunately, that's not being recognized very often. Um, so it's our job through the education piece of our mission to talk about it, to be the one to say, yeah, it's happening. We got to pay attention to this. Um, and it's happening, it's not just happening in the places where we think, oh yeah, that makes sense because it's a lower income um, neighborhood or because they you know the kids dropped out of school or because they're homeless or because they're vulnerable for all these other things. It's happening in our churches. It's happening in our schools and in our homes. Um, I, um, I grew up in that, similar to Monica, I grew up in that two-parent home. Many of you know my parents. You know that I, I grew up in a good neighborhood, in a good church, in a good environment. Um, yet, at 17 years old, I decided I was going to go my own way. And I was lured away from that good home and that environment um, via an online connection. Um, to a predator's home, 700 miles away. I was um, manipulated into standing, um, ultimately standing in front of a video camera nude um, as this man took pictures and video of me um, undressing, trying on different outfits. Um, and he uh, essentially had his way with me over the course of a weekend. Um, and I didn't tell anyone about it for 12 years. I walked away from that environment, um, convinced that it was my fault, shouldn't have been dumb enough to answer that online ad, shouldn't have been stupid enough to fall for his tactics. And if I tell anyone, they're, that's just that's what they're gonna tell me, they're gonna shrug their shoulders, oh well you shouldn't have been that stupid, and walk away. Um, but over, um, so I think that initial event, I, I put it aside, like others have said, I put it aside, it's time to move on, um, put on your big girl pants and let's 
move on with life. Um, but it, what I didn't realize over the course of those 10 to 12 years is um, that man stole something from me um, that I can't ever get back. Um, and it determined my life for the next decade. Um, I was filled with so much anger and shame and feelings of betrayal from like self-betrayal and betrayal from others. Um, addiction, abuse, I was homeless at one point um, and just disdain for myself and others. Um, I was miserable and really ready to give up. In the seven years that Transforming Hope has been around, I've heard story after story just like mine. Um, and uh, let me go back a second. The, um, what this man did is considered sexual exploitation. Um, if he has taken that video and distributed it, that is the definition of human trafficking. I don't know if that happened. I do know that it was a setup. I know that there was a whole process over months um, that I knew nothing about until later. Um, so that's, and that's what we're seeing with kids in America. These, the stories I'm hearing over and over that are just like mine is this months and months of work and planning and setup. And these kids are being lured in because we need a place to stay. We want, um, we want a relationship. We want someone to pay attention to us. We want, um, we're looking for the newest shoes or the newest whatever the trend is. Um, mom and dad just gave me my first smartphone and now I can connect with thousands of people in just a minute on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Um, and they're falling over and over and over, falling for these traps of people who want to use them for profit. Um, many, many victims are survivors of human trafficking have significant vulnerabilities, such as living in lower income communities or being homeless, living with a single parent or a parent with addiction, um, experiencing violence at home, um, but also experiencing that early childhood um, sexual abuse. Um, and we know that the more exposure a child has to sexual abuse of any kind, the more exposed they are to something like human trafficking. Many times we've heard pimps or traffickers use this tactic uh, or this, this way of manipulating kids to say, um, well, you've, been, you've already been doing it, why not get paid for it? So they take something so ugly and evil in this child's life and twist it around so that they can make a profit off of it. Um, Exposure to sexual abuse, as we've seen today, isn't confined to the neighborhoods that we drive past quickly so we don't get caught in the middle of some um, gang activity or so our kids don't witness a drug deal on the street corner. I know you know the communities I'm talking about. Um, I'm actually going to do an egg hunt at one of those communities later today. That's why I'm dressed a little, a little um, more casual. <laughs> Um, so I get to run around and dance with about 200 kids later today in one of those communities. <coughs> Human trafficking is not just an international issue. It's happening to our kids in our cities, our schools, our churches, and our homes. Um, another big thing that we've, as, as we've done this work, we've done a whole lot of trial and error in seven years, and we've figured out um, not just what we think is best for the community, but what the community actually needs in terms of understanding human trafficking um, and then preventing human trafficking has become a big thing for us. Uh, we're tired of just pulling people out of the river. We want to go upstream and figure out why they're falling in in the first place and keep them from doing that. Um, so with prevention, uh, one thing we've really been able to do this year is that um, working with the kids in these communities, but also talking to parents and children about um, not just human trafficking, but things like consent and healthy boundaries, um, helping kids determine who their safe people are, um, and helping parents understand that it's not solely about teaching our kids stranger danger. Uh, because 
like we've seen, that's that's not the reality of what's happening. This is, um, the predators are people we know, people that we've built relationships with, people that have not truly been vetted as safe people. Um, so uh, one thing we've really been able to do this year is talk more with parents. Um, as, um, We've kind of backdoored the idea of human trafficking because I, I am a parent, I have an 11 year old daughter, and I understand that that's probably the scariest thing to think about happening to our kids. Um, but I will talk about when I hand over this smartphone to my child, how do I prepare her for that kind of power and that kind of access? When I, um, you know, I put a computer in the house, how do I train my child to know what to look for, what to close down, how to deal with um, the cyber world. So we talk to parents a lot about internet safety, and in those conversations we can talk about the other things, the consent and boundaries, um, and some of the things that as survivors we wish others had talked to us about, or to our parents about, had prepared them for. Um, Um, we do that, I do that, um, talking to parents, because five years ago, um, the first person I told my story to was my counselor, um, and it wasn't even intentional. It was, I think I was even more than three sessions in. I don't remember how far I was into counseling, but I was going because I told my, we had opened a safe home with Transforming Hope, and I told my staff, we all need to go to counseling because this is going to be hard work. And so I had to lead by example, right? So I'm sitting on the couch because I have to, sitting on her couch because I have to, and there was some, something else we were talking about triggered that memory, and it's like my brain just stopped disasso disassociating in that moment, and it all came out. And it was horrible, I was miserable. Um, the next few sessions were painful to talk about. Um, because it's like all, all the dots in my life started connecting. Um, but I kept going. Um, took me uh, four years to get through everything. I started sharing, as I shared with my counselor, I saw how it was a little easier to then go to my parents and share a little bit with them. And some of the other the mentors and the same people in my life, I shared a little bit with them. And, and nobody responded in the way that I had told myself for 12 years they were going to respond. So then I kept sharing, and little by little I realized um, this is what I'm supposed to do. This is, I'm supposed to, God redeemed my story so that he could save others through it, so he could redeem others through it. Um, the very first time I shared my story in front of an audience, um, I wanted to throw up. And I probably looked like that too because the host asked me, um, do you need a minute to pray real quick? <laughs> I said, yes, yes I do. Um, and I had my Bible with me and God, in that moment, God showed me Exodus 4.12. Um, it's, it's in Moses' story where he's giving God the laundry list of excuses as to why he can't go back and talk to Pharaoh. And God, I think, what I picture is God's like, all right, man, like, stop. That's enough. And God says in Exodus 12, now go. I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. I wasn't going to cry. <laughs> but he said that, and it, um, I have never questioned or feared sharing my story since then. Because I have seen firsthand, as I'm sharing, other people are being set free. So I have to keep sharing because I'm setting, I'm, I'm allowing God to set adults free, and I'm preventing children from falling into the same thing. Um, so that's that's why we got into this teaching children as well, teaching. Um, 
parents to protect their children. Um, we, someone once told me the devil thrives in secrecy. Um, I think far too often, especially in communities like where I grew up, um, there's this resistance to talk to our kids about things like sex because then they're going to want to do it. Um, and I think actually the opposite, the opposite is true. I think if we don't talk about it, it becomes this big secret, taboo, well, why not? Why shouldn't I do it? Um, when we, as I've seen with my daughter, as we talk about it, it's no longer a secret. It's, it's in the light. Satan can't hold anything against, can't hold anything against her now um, because mom's already told me everything. Um, she, just this week, she, she's supposed to wear glasses all the time. She doesn't. And I fuss at her about it almost every day. And earlier this week, she got in the car and said, where are your glasses? You're supposed to be wearing them 24-7. And she said, I'm never wearing my glasses again if I have to see what I saw today. And I said, well, what happened? She said, we had the sex talk and they showed pictures. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I understand. I said, did they, but did they say anything new to you? She said, no. You already told me everything. We don't have to talk about it again. <laughs> so... <laughs> So good, okay, well job done, good for me. Um, that, that, that wasn't um, true with me growing up. We didn't have those conversations. Um, the, there were topics that I thought were off limits. There were issues that I didn't feel like I could talk to my parents about and I've heard that um, story over and over and over from others as well. So my encouragement to parents is that even though it feels scary and maybe they're not ready for this, there are ways to talk to our kids. We have to know that talking to our kids empowers them. It doesn't hurt them, it empowers them. It keeps them safe. And you help me do my job by preventing human trafficking. Um, and, and it builds a safe place within your home. So that when, if and when things do happen, my daughter knows exactly who to go to. Because I'm a, there are no, there's no topic off limits, and there's no judgment when something does happen. Um, I think that's the, that's the best way that we can prevent sexual abuse and sex trafficking. Um, Um, I we have I wanted to share quickly too that because we've gotten into talking to parents um, we wanted to not we don't want to just um, dump a bunch of information on you and then not help you in some way so we on our website we've created an entire page of free resources for parents um, with different websites and links and tools um, we have books um, these, these two books we don't sell um, right now, but we have them available for parents to look at um, so that uh, like as a resource to get at some point. We do sell, um, one of the books we sell is Parenting in a Digital World, um, and it was written by law, it's written by law enforcement, and it's like a step-by-step how-to on protecting your kids from very young to the time they leave the house, um, protecting them and preparing them for the digital world. Um, and then the other one we have to sell is called Renting Lacey. It was written by the founder of Shared Hope International. Um, this one is more probably just for parents to learn a little bit more of what human trafficking looks like in the US. Um, specific stories of survivors, um, from very horrific to very subtle, um, to just understand the issue a little better.
we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you so much. Um, next up is Crystal Sutherland. She's traveled here from Wilmington, North Carolina, and she's going to share her message of hope with us. Thank you. Hello, I am very thrilled to be here with you today and have an opportunity to talk about hope and healing. You've heard stories, you've heard a lot of stories today, you've heard a lot of information. I'm sure your, your head is just reeling at the moment. Um, so I am really going to spend a little bit of time talking about my story just briefly so you can understand the basis for my book. And my book is called Journey to Heal, and, but before I get there, I want to introduce you to you some very important people in my life. And that's my family. Aside from being an author and a mentor for survivors of sexual abuse, I am first and foremost a wife and a mother of three and a nana to two, and I'm in my 15th year of homeschooling. Woohoo! <laughs> and uh, it's very exciting to me, you know, these precious people right here have been my support system, they have been an integral part of my healing, and they have also, as you will hear later in my story, they've also taken the brunt of a lot of the aftermath of sexual trauma that I've been through, and the brunt of that was a lot of anger that I had, and much of my anger was misplaced on those beautiful people right there. So I'm going to talk about that just a little bit and why all of this conversation today is so important, but it can't end here. That conversation that we've had today needs to, you need to marinate on that when you go home, you need to talk about it, it needs to be brought up many times over. I encourage you to pick up the resources that are here and I hope you will pick up a copy of my book for no other reason other than it will help to educate you on what what the aftermath of sexual trauma looks like and what the process of healing, what, what's involved and um, how you can come alongside and help someone who has been through this, any form of sexual trauma. So I am a survivor of childhood sexual abuse, but actually I like to refer to myself as an overcomer because, because honestly, the Lord has taken me through a lot of healing steps that has brought me to a point where I've learned how to not only survive, but really thrive. And that's the essence and uh, passion behind um, my, my story I'm going to share with you today and also the hope and healing I'm going to talk about. And one of my greatest passions is truly to help others um, find that same hope and healing that I have found. And so I do that through this book. Uh, this book has taken me, it took me 10 years to, to write. Uh, we've talked a lot about writing. I think Connie talked about um, writing, and I know that Monica talked about the importance of journaling and how healing that has been for her. Well, that was the case for me, too. I couldn't, I really could not have spoken my story to a counselor. I know I wouldn't have been able to do that because I could barely utter the words myself. But what I could do is write my story down in a journal, in a diary, which I did. I have stacks and stacks of them. And that's where I really processed a lot of my feelings. I processed the Word of God as it, as it was relating to me and my life. And um, basically what happened was this. God pressed on my heart through a course of, of my journey. He took me through seven steps, basically, or stages. And these are just kind of things that he took me through and showed me both in just the biblical truths that I was learning in my um, church and in my own uh, Bible study, and then just some practical wisdom that I gleaned along the way. And let me just tell you this. My book covers seven steps, but I'm going to say this, and it's very important that everyone here understand, especially if you are a survivor of some form of sexual trauma. It's important to understand that healing takes time. I don't believe there are any quick fixes or simple solutions to healing. I don't believe that for a moment. Um, there's no magic pills. I wish there was. Healing can take really, truly a lifetime. And it requires intentional effort on the part of the victim. And it requires patient 
and very caring support of those around them. We talked to, I think someone mentioned safe places and safe people, and that is exactly what is involved in the process of healing. But ultimately, I believe that sexual trauma leaves a soul wound that only God can heal, and that healing happens as we place our hope in Christ. And it's through that relationship that we will go on an even greater journey of faith. And not only will we experience healing, but we will experience the abundant life that, that God intended for us originally. And a life full of grace and hope and love. And that truly is the basis for my book. Author and sexual abuse survivor Mary DeMuth once said, I believe sexual abuse is Satan's greatest weapon against humanity. I couldn't agree with her more. And this weapon that he is yielding against humanity is wreaking havoc in our culture. As you um, have heard earlier, and I'm going to share these stats with you again just very quickly, very briefly, and that is this. As you saw in an earlier video and as was shared uh, multiple times here today, based on reported cases, statistics reveal that every 98 seconds someone in the U.S. is being sexually assaulted. Furthermore, there are 1 in 10 children, this is boys and girls alike, in America alone who will be sexually abused before they reach the age of 18. Over 90% know their abuser, and 60% will never tell anyone. Again, these are only based on reported cases, and we already know that cases of, of sexual violence go severely underreported. Finally, there are well over 42 million adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse in America. Well over 42 million. Men and women, just like you and me, and I want you just to let that sink in for a moment because this isn't something that we just hear on a regular basis really anywhere. So it's kind of like, wow, wait a second, does that, what does that look like? Well, let me just tell you. There, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, there are approximately 252 million adults in America today. If you just do some quick math of that 42 million, that means 16%, and, and this is again based on reported cases, but that means 16% or more of our adult population have experienced childhood sexual abuse. That means they were sexually assaulted under the age of 18. Again, only based on reported cases. And you might be thinking, well, again, why am I not hearing about this? Why is this not talked about enough? And I will say there are more voices, just like today. Here we are today in this wonderful seminar, and we're talking about this very important issue that we need to address, not only, not only as a culture, but we need to address it, especially as the body of Christ. While there are more voices that are speaking and coming out about this issue, we still don't talk about it enough to change the tide. So we've got to change that. We've got to break the silence. Not just those of us who have been through sexual trauma, but those of us who care, those of us who call ourselves believers, we have got to break the silence. We've got to talk about this. No matter how shameful, no matter how ugly, no matter how dark it is, we have to talk about it. We need to be in everybody's face about it <laughs> because it's that serious. It's that serious, and it's worth it, okay? Just like it's been shared here, when we talk about it, we set ourselves free, and we set other people free. I believe that we don't talk about it because there are stigmas attached, stigmas of guilt, stigmas of shame, but I also believe that sharing our story shatters these stigmas. It breaks the silence so that healing conversations can take place, just like this healing conversation that is taking place today and the many that will follow after this seminar. That is why I'm sharing mine with you today. Not because I'm brave, not because I'm bold, because honestly I'm not I'm shaking in my knees right now. I've shared my story a bajillion times. And it's still hard every time. I'm one of the 42 million. I'm also one of the 90%, over 90%, who knew their abuser. I'm also one of the 60% who never reported her abuse. 
Like most survivors, my um, story is very complicated and messy. I, uh, you know, I did, I did come from a two-parent home. My parents were teenagers when they had babies. They were just babies. They got married because of me, and they divorced shortly after. I think they lasted maybe two years. They went their separate ways. I spent a little bit of time with my dad, but I really didn't have a ongoing relationship with him until later in my life. So I lived with my mother. My mother remarried. That didn't work. She divorced. She remarried again. And it was this husband, this man, that brought about our my first sibling. My mother, I was about nine years old at the time. She, was, she remarried, and she was pregnant with my first sibling. And she... You know, she loved this man, and, and I did too because he was like a father figure to me. He seemed to really care about me as if I was his own child, and everything was absolutely wonderful until one night when it all changed, and that was the night that he first molested me. I was about 10 years old at the time. It was me, somewhere in there. It's one I had here. <laughs> I could not understand what was happening to me or why. And out of shock and fear, I kept silent. I was afraid of him, yes, of course, but I was also afraid of my mother because I learned at a very early age that um, I should fear my mother. She was violent and she was volatile and I never knew exactly what her responses were gonna be and she could be very abusive. So very early on, I, I became afraid of her response and I was afraid that if I told her she was going to blame me so he continued to abuse me for the next five years but in those dark years I met Jesus I was 13 years old at the time I'll never forget it we lived out in the sticks in this very rural area of southwest Virginia and when I say rural I mean I can't even claim there was a stoplight there was no stoplight I'm not sure there's any stop signs so we were out there and it was a little Pentecostal holiness church. And I was invited to this little youth rally at this little Pentecostal holiness church. And so off I go. I have no idea what I'm getting myself into. Anybody in here been to a Pentecostal holiness church? Okay, well, it's an experience. So anyway, the preacher was preaching hellfire and brimstone. You have to imagine this man had white hair. He was very scary looking. And he was just, whoo, red-faced and very upset. And he was preaching about hellfire and brimstone. And I... You know, I just, the thought occurred to me as I was hearing all of what he was saying, and my little 13 year old brain was thinking, I'm going to go to hell for what my stepfather's doing to me. I'm sure of that. So I did the most logical thing. When you're in that situation, you give your heart to Jesus. <laughs> and that's exactly what I did. And our relationship kind of started out fragile at best. As you can imagine, it was more based on fear than love, but I eventually came to understand that he really did love me. And one of the first passages of scripture that my little 13-year-old brain memorized is found in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And, and I'm going to read this to you because it's just absolutely beautiful. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Now, why that's so important to me, because at that time, my paths were not straight. My life was a mess. I had a horrible situation at home. I was being sexually abused regularly by a man who was six-something tall in his 40s. My mother scared me, yelling all the time, and a baby sister that I spent a whole lot of time watching and babysitting. Things just did not look straight to me. But that passage of scripture told me that I could trust God. He was bigger than me. And he would set all of this to right. If I just, if I just did that much, took the pressure off of me. So I did learn to trust him. And he did, in time, make my path straight. But I will tell you that things got worse before they got better. I became desperate. I became suicidal. I wanted to run away at one point. But, you know, when you live out in those sticks... And everybody knows everybody, and you're in a real tiny community. You can't run away because somebody's going to pick you up and take you back home. And this I knew to be true. So that wasn't to be. And I'm too, I have way too uh, low of power, uh, pain tolerance level, so there was absolutely no way I was going to go through with the committing suicide. And I'm not trying to make light of those feelings. Please, humor is part of my way of, of dealing but I will tell you, though, I do have a low pain tolerance. <laughs> anyway, so all of that said, 
I, I then turned to God, and I was like, you know, I just, okay, God, you're really big, and I'm learning about you in Sunday school, and I'm learning about, wow, okay, all this amazing stuff, you know, that you're doing with the Israelites, and you're bringing them out, and the Red Sea's parting, and these plagues, and all this stuff, you know, all this Old Testament-style rescue. I was like, I, I need some of that, please. I need some of that. A small plague, anything, please. Just take, wipe out my stepfather, please. And my mother, too, it's okay. <laughs> it made sense to my teenage brain, but it was not to be. Now, while he didn't intervene for me Old Testament style, he did give me the courage to tell my mother what was happening. He gave me the courage to break the silence, to talk about it. And I knew my mother was not a safe person but I couldn't take it anymore. And he also gave me the ability to live through the events that would follow. So I was 15 years old and I told her. Her response was exactly what I feared most. She blamed me. The abuse stopped that day, but we remained and continued as a very dysfunctional family for the next two years. And as you can imagine, I went on a downward spiral from there. I had trouble at home, I had trouble at school. I was reckless in my relationship with boys, and I found myself in a very oh, disastrous situation with a young man at my school. Things started out innocently enough, but they progressed very fast, and one <coughs> afternoon he sexually assaulted me. I didn't consent, and nine months later, my first child was born. You can imagine the home environment that I had at that point. So I moved out of my house with my child at 17. I tried at that point just to forget, to cope, and to survive. I set out to finish graduating high school. I ended up attending college, and it was at college that I met my husband, Wes, that you saw in the picture earlier. And this year, we celebrate 23 years of marriage. God is good. We got married out of college and I continued to ignore and tuck away the abuse. I really honestly thought I could just move past it, but I was in my 30s, a stay-at-home mother of three, very active in my church before I realized that I needed to tell someone. I needed to heal. I needed to face my story and figure out what needed to happen next. All those years of pushing aside did not make it go away, not at all. I was angry. I was controlling. I was an absolute perfectionist. OCD didn't even begin to describe me. I avoided physical intimacy at, at all cost for almost 10 years of my marriage. That's one thing that didn't get touched on in today, and I do want to say out loud, if that's, if that's you, if you've experienced that, if you've had trouble and you're here and you've experienced sexual trauma and, and you have a problem with physical intimacy even though you're in a loving marriage, let me tell you, that is normal. That is a side effect of what we've been through. You're not, you're not crazy. I thought I was. I thought I was. But God healed that because he's good and that's what he can do. I had deep insecurities, and what I didn't understand at that time is that I was suffering from severe PTSD symptoms. Wes, my husband Wes, and a, a mentor friend of mine from my church began to kind of point out that maybe, maybe, maybe there might be some connections to what I'm going through now in terms of what might, you know, might be some connections to what I went through in the past, my, my story of abuse. So I began to search for resources on healing, and there was not a lot 15 years ago, I can tell you. But what I found pointed me to God's word, and it pointed me um, to having a relationship with him and his ways. And so through his word, through my relationship with him that I just continued to work on and focus on, and through the love of my family and the support, the very loving, very patient and caring support of my church community, God led me through a series of steps or stages towards healing over a period of 10 years. And he mended me in ways that I did not even think possible. And one of the big ways, one of the ways I was hurting the most was about my body image and about my 
sexuality and being able to feel comfortable in my own skin and being able to feel comfortable in my relationship with my dear husband who loved me very much. And not only did he mend, my, mend me in ways I didn't think possible, but he encouraged me to share this journey with others and that's how I came to write Journey to Heal. One of the critical first steps that I talk about in my book involves exactly what we've been doing here today and that is breaking the silence and sharing our stories to acknowledge what happened to talk about it with someone safe which i'm going to talk about safe people here in just a little bit because when we share our stories in safe places with safe people feelings of guilt and shame fade away we discover we're not alone and there's hope for healing and this was certainly the case for my friend josh ryan and I want to direct your attention to the screen. Josh also attends my church, which is Port City Community Church. He is a husband. He's a father. He's an avid surfer. This man, let me just explain to you. I don't even think it's, I don't even know how. He's huge. He's huge. Very intimidating guy. Has a beautiful wife, beautiful family. He's about my age. And for many years of his life, he has struggled with drugs and alcohol because of a story that he kept silent for all these years. And it's only in the last year that he came to realize that he needed to acknowledge his story of abuse in order to begin the journey to heal. So I'd like for you just to direct your attention to the screen and we're gonna hear Josh's story. It's just something you don't want to admit and it's something that you want to hide, uh, something you want to just bury. I mean, I was nine years old, so, you know, that age, you know, that you just don't know. You, you don't really know what's going on. So, uh, just come to grips with the abuse, the, um, the sexual abuse, and, and, and feeling confident enough to start talking about it was, was a big step for me. In my case, um, burying it was just not healthy. It wound up getting to a point where it was it was out of control, and when I would start drinking and start you know going down that road, I just took it to the uh, furthest I could. And masking these emotions have uh, I, I've really connected the dot there. I realized over the last you know six months that I've just been suppressing uh, so much anger and so much uh, confusion um, to really what happened. And I told my wife, and you know, she thought it was a it was a really big deal. So there was immediate gratification and immediate weight off my shoulders when I did talk to her about it initially. My load has gotten lighter and lighter and lighter as this whole thing has come out. So getting it out in the open, I think this is part of, of, of God's plan, is to educate and bring the awareness uh, out there that, yeah, you know, this has happened to your average person. Sharing this type of story is obviously not easy. I am still going through the whole surrender process, and I'm just trusting God with all of this. I've never uh, had a clear mind and um, it's beneficial in so many ways, especially with, you know, my, my immediate family. You know, I'm becoming a better husband, I'm becoming a better father, I'm becoming a better friend. Praying about it and talking about it uh, really has helped me to just trust God uh, with the whole thing. And I can take a big breath of fresh air and say, hey, you know, I'm here for a reason, and uh, that reason is still being unveiled uh, on a daily basis. You know, Josh's story is not uncommon at all. Um, you know, sadly, many, many, many people <sighs> remain silent for years. You know, I certainly did. I shared with you, you know, I was in my 30s. Um, there are other speakers here that shared, you know, that they carried theirs around for a very long time as well. I currently mentor, over the last four years, I have been mentoring women who have um, gone through some form of sexual trauma. I mentor women anywhere between the ages of, let's say, early 20s all the way into their 60s. You would be surprised how many women will hold on to their stories and they're, they're in their early 50s, 
late 60s, and they've carried the weight around. They've been through marriage after marriage, situation after situation. They've tried drugs, they've tried alcohol, they've tried all kinds of things, coping mechanisms to, to kind of push back their stories. And they'll carry this before they realize that they need to talk about it. And I want to just say, you know, I don't know your story here, but if that's you, if you've carried it around, just like Michelle said, you really are in a safe place and among some very safe people, and this is a great time to maybe just take that first step and talk about it. Tell someone, schedule an appointment maybe to meet with Michelle or, or someone else who's here that can, that can sit down with you and talk about it. I want you to know there's no rejection or judgment. Not among those of us who have been through this, that's for sure. So let's talk about what's involved in the journey to heal. Let's talk about hope and healing. In the next slide, I have uh, kind of an overview of how my book is set up. I talk about these seven essential steps. And again, I just want to tell you, these are really more like stages than steps because this isn't going to happen in seven easy steps in seven weeks and boom, you're done. It's not going to work that way. It's going to take a good while. And you may go from step one to step two to step three, and then you're going to go back and process step two a little more because you're starting to gain, you know, some of your memories are coming back and, and then there's something new to process and deal with. So I'm just going to, I'm not going to dive down deep into these. We don't, first of all, have time, but then second of all, I have my book um, on the table out there, and I really encourage you to get it and um, take a look at this more closely. But the first is to commit to the journey. That's probably the first and the hardest step. And really, that involves acknowledging the trauma, facing it, and being willing to get some help, seeing the need that you need to get some help. For me, I saw it because I was taking out so much repressed anger. Just like Josh said, he had he was so angry. Josh, Josh took his anger and put it into alcohol. I took mine and I let it spill out into anger outbursts at home. Controlling behavior, perfectionism, depression. Repressed anger eventually turns into depression. And I realized I needed to do something. I ate my problems. Anybody else in here do that? Yeah. Oh man, me and carbohydrates, we were buddies. I also spent, spent a lot. Because shopping made me feel good and it was something I could control. But I didn't realize these were coping mechanisms. And none of it was making me feel better, not long term. So I had to dig deeper. I had to, I, had to, I had to step into some healing. So the first is committing to the journey. Making a commitment to yourself because honestly the journey is hard and it's arduous. You're going to feel like you're taking two steps forward and five steps back sometimes. And you just got to be patient with yourself. And the people around you need to be patient because there's no quick way to overcome and work through all of this. The second is to face the truth. Michelle brought up this. How important the truth is. Jesus said, in um, Matthew 8, or John 8, 32, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I, he was talking about the gospel. He's talking about himself, but I believe it applies everywhere. When we know the truth, and one of the first things that I learned was from Dan Allender in his book called The Wounded Heart. He actually explained what childhood sexual abuse was. I'm not, I'm not going to go through that, but it was so eye-opening to me. It was a clinical definition of child sexual abuse, and it, it just like, it was like he was reading my mail. Like he saw it was there, and he knew, and it made me realize that what happened to me was, was a crime, and it was not my fault. So I talk about in this particular chapter how, how important it is to face your story, how important it is to face certain truths that it's not your fault, you're not alone, and there's hope for healing. And in this, I also emphasize the importance of journaling. So when Monica talked about, and just mind you, none of us have heard each other's uh, talks. This is our first time as speakers hearing each other. So when Monica said that, I was like, yes and amen, that's exactly it. Because that's exactly what I tell women to do in my book, to journal. And Connie, of course, she shared it as well, and it was just beautiful. It, the writing process, it slows our brain down. It actually slows us down 
long enough to process. So Connie, when God was telling you to write your, your story down, he knew exactly what you needed to get all of that out. And, and writing does that, art does that, painting does that, it's all beautiful. So that's in that particular step. The third step is sharing your story, which we've talked about today. And I talk about, in this particular chapter, I talk about the importance of finding safe people. Maybe it's a Christian counselor. Maybe it's a mentor at church. Maybe it's a pastor who's well-versed on the topic of sexual trauma. Maybe it's a professional counselor. Or maybe it's just a really close friend who's going to listen to you without judgment and who's not going to give you pat answers or throw scripture verses at you and think it's going to make it all better. The fourth step is settling the unsettled. Settling the unsettled is really important. That's all about dealing with these unresolved emotions, emotions of, 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 of anger and resentment and bitterness. And I, I can't even tell you, I can't even tell you how many people tell Women will tell me, I'm not mad, I'm not mad about it. And you know what? When I hear that, I hear all I hear is, I'm not dealt with my story, I'm not dealt with my story. <laughs> because the truth of the matter is, is when you realize what was taken from you, when you realize what was damaged, what was wounded, oh my word, everybody gets a little bit angry. And anger is not a sin. Anger is not a sin. What, what the sin is, is what we do with it. Okay? We can either have righteous anger and we can do great things. I'm telling you, anger is what's driving me to stand here before you. It's a good and righteous anger. Anger is what drove me to write this book. So that's good. The bad stuff is what I was doing to my family. That's what you got to work through. So in that particular chapter, I talk about the importance of identifying where are those little residual hidden resentments, those, that, those bitter pieces of bitterness, and where is the anger? And who is it directed to? Let's figure that out. Can't possibly be everybody. It's got to be isolated to some very specific people. And in order to be able to get to the next step, which is forgiving and letting go, we have to go through all of those steps. And quite honestly, we even got to have a little bit of six and seven, which I'm going to talk about in a moment as well. Forgiving and letting go, which you'll hear a lot of people will say, oh, honey, if you just forgive, you know, you'll be able to forget it and you'll be able to move on. No, ma'am. No, 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 no. Eventually, yes. Eventually, that is the most healing thing that we can do. But it will take time. It will take time. And, it need, it, and a lot of things need to happen ahead of time. So, I want, this leads me to a really good friend of mine. Um, her name is Abby. And I have a slide. I, I want to share Abby's story with you right now. Abby, I met her through a request at Port City Community Church where I attend. I'm a biblical counselor there. And a friend of a friend had suggested she come to me because she was mad. I mean mad, over the top mad. I don't think I have ever seen anybody so mad, aside from myself, ever. She was angry at God. She was angry at her husband. She was angry at her kids. She was angry at her pastor at the church. She was angry everywhere, just mad. And she couldn't figure out or pinpoint exactly where this was coming from. But through several weeks of working with her through my book, listening to her story, allowing her opportunity to share, which also she had carried her story around for 28 years. This young mother and wife and, and, and staff member actually at her church carried around her story for 28 years. And so through our time of working um, together, she painstakingly also wrote her story down and she began to realize that it was not her abuser she was angry with, but it was actually her parents for not coming to her defense, for not responding appropriately. I loved what Abby was talking about earlier. She really spent some time kind of talking about the importance of having these hard and difficult conversations with our kids. And on the other spectrum of that, if our children come to us and say, hey, this happened. We've got to be prepared with no judgment, no blaming, just listening and rescue. What can we do to make this and set this right now? What can I do to come to your defense? That sort of thing. And then we need to do it. Abby realized that it was not her abuser, but it was her parents. And I want to share that video with you now of Abby sharing kind of what it meant for her to work through these feelings of anger so she could reach to a place where she could finally forgive. If you'll direct your attention to the screen. Throughout this healing process, 
um, and going through the Journey to Heal book with Becky and Crystal, I was surprised at who the anger and bitterness that I've carried around for so long was actually directed towards. In the past, I had taken some steps towards healing, um, but it wasn't until going through the Journey to Heal book with Becky and Crystal that God brought about some true change. In the midst of being abused by my cousin as a child, I told my parents what was being done to me. After that initial conversation, we never discussed it again. The abuse eventually stopped, but I never got the help that I needed. I never even knew if my cousin had been confronted. I was not even told that what was done to me wasn't my fault or that it wasn't normal. This left a, a black spot in my heart that seemed to ooze anger and pain and bitterness and worthlessness. I felt completely abandoned in this pain. Um, and what the most confusing part was is that this was totally contrary to every other experience that I'd had with my mom and dad. Um, they were otherwise loving and supportive and encouraging parents. So my mind struggled to reconcile what felt like two sets of parents to me. I carried all of this around for 28 years and um, this pain and anger came out in obvious and not so obvious ways. After a while and going through this journey to heal book, um, I knew that God was ready for me to confront my mom and dad, to share with them um, the hurt and um, the, the frustration and the difficulty that being left alone to the fallout of this abuse had caused in my life. So I wrote an anger letter to my mom and dad. I prayed a lot <laughs> before I did. And um, I just asked God to pick up the pen and pour out everything that I've been carrying around for so many years onto those pages. And he did. I felt an immediate release. It was wonderful. And then God said, I want you to send that letter. I knew that he was ready to break these chains that had held myself and my mom and my dad up for so long. So I prayed again. And I sent that letter and I waited <laughs> those were really emotional days but um, my parents called and left a message the day that they received the letter to let me know that they would be mailing a letter back to me the next day so I waited again and I prayed again and um, I just remember getting that letter a couple of days later and my hands were shaking so much as I broke open the seal. But as I read the words, the peace that passes all understanding just began to wash over me. My parents took full ownership of abandoning, abandoning me in that pain. Um, they admitted that they didn't realize the scope of my abuse and that they didn't um, understand what the fallout of that abuse would be. Um, and they just, they just completely took ownership. It was awesome. And, um, and one day God decimated 28 years of walls and anger and he healed that resentment and um, the feelings of worthlessness. It was nothing short of miraculous. It really was. I have no other explanation other than it was God divinely intervening. Through that letter and the many conversations that I've had with my mom and dad since, I've heard everything that I've needed to hear to move forward in my healing. When I was a child, my parents got it really, really wrong. But with God's help as an adult, they got it really, really right. And I sit here now um, and can say that I've forgiven them and I have a healthy, restored relationship with them, and it's awesome. You know, I want to I want to say this. You know, Abby, she's a sweetheart. She's in one of my Bible studies that I teach, and um, she is just an awesome woman of God. She has a passion for foster care. That's that's her. Um, what well, she believes God has called her to, and that's what her family is a part of. And um, so she, her, and her husband foster children. Um, you know, as they as they can, and as that works out. And I will tell you that. 
you know, Abby worked through probably the greatest part of her pain, which was her anger, which was the betrayal of her parents, the, the sense of abandonment. And she is still on this journey to heal in some other ways, but that was probably one of the biggest parts that she really, really needed to deal with. And she, you know, she's right. She, they still have a very beautiful relationship. They've connected in ways that they haven't and were not able to prior to that. And it's just a beautiful thing. I want you just to, I want to just remind you that healing does involve a journey. It is not an event. It takes time. It takes the right support. It takes a great deal of trust and prayer, as Abby said, um, to move forward. And I want to just stop for a second. You know, perhaps someone here relates with one of the stories that have been shared. Maybe you relate with Abby's story or Josh's or Monica's um, or Michelle's or mine or the other, you know, uh, folks that have spoken here. If you've experienced sexual trauma, I don't want you to think for a second that my book or anyone else's book is going to heal or fix this. It really is going to take, as I said earlier, an ongoing relationship with God, His Word, and His ways. That's really the greater journey to go on. But there are some essential steps that you can take for yourself that you can work through, as I described earlier. And I would encourage you to do that. I want to encourage you that there is hope for healing in all aspects and areas after sexual trauma. There are resources here available to you today. Some of them have already been mentioned, but just real quickly, I want to encourage you to stop by all of the tables. Just spend some time. There's plenty more treats and sweets and stuff to eat. And um, I would encourage you, to to stop by the Journey to Heal table because there you're going to find a few other books. I don't have copies of those books here for sale. I have my book, but I don't have theirs. But my publisher also produced a book um, called Naming Our Abuse for Men Who Have Been Sexually Traumatized um, as Children. Uh, there's two books for support uh, systems and, and, and support people of someone who has gone through sexual trauma. The first is when the woman you love was sexually abused and the other is when the man you love was um, sexually abused. So both of those kind of give some insight as to how to communicate, how to listen, and how to read the signs and symptoms that are involved in ongoing healing for someone who's been through sexual trauma. We also offer an online study. It's actually a Journey to Heal. It's through my ministry, which is Journey to Heal Ministries, and it is called the Journey to Heal Online Study. <laughs> and basically, it's a seven-week free online um, group, uh, a private group that I go through with women. I have one coming up that actually starts May 7th that's going to be in conjunction with a face-to-face -face Journey to Heal group that Michelle is going to lead that starts the 11th of May. Mine starts May 7th, and basically, I think it runs through June 18th, but it's a wonderful way to meet other women, if you're, and it is for women, but it's a wonderful way to meet other women who are going on this journey as well, and to kind of have someone hold your hand through this book. So maybe you're not here, maybe you're here and it's not your story, but you know someone who would benefit from this, I would encourage you to pick up some information about that at my table. Also, um, I do provide a women's retreat for uh, women who want to go through my book, who either have already read it and gone through it, or who want to kind of start that journey. And I do a two-day retreat with women. I have another one coming up in the fall. Also, there is obviously uh, counseling available here. Um, Michelle can connect you with resources um, for local counselors. And then for those of you who are caregivers, I want to just real briefly as I'm closing, and I promise I am closing, if you'll go to the next slide, I want to just very, very briefly go over this real fast with you. And that is, if you're a caregiver, if you're a family member, a friend, or someone who works alongside someone who has, who has the symptoms of, of possibly sexual trauma, or maybe you just know their story because they've told you, or perhaps you find yourself in a situation where they want to tell you their story. I want to give you some guidelines. And you can also find these. There's, there's two or three different kinds of resources on uh, the table out there that goes over these as well, along with some other wonderful information. The first thing to do is to listen carefully. I've just got to say that. Listen very carefully. Listen more than you speak. Believe them, affirm them, encourage counseling if you think it's needed.
needed. Encourage medical attention. If, if someone tells you that they've been sexually traumatized and it's happened within a week, be sure to encourage immediate medical attention. Don't judge them, don't blame them, don't minimize their story, and whatever you do, don't break their confidence. And you might think, well, I would never minimize their story. But you know what happens when we say things like, when someone shares their story and we say things like, well, honey, God, you know, he didn't intend that, and he can work everything together for our good. That's a beautiful truth. But when someone's sharing your, their story of sexual trauma with you, it's not something you say. When someone's grieving that pain, when they're, in the sh when they're in the initial throes of getting their story out, we can very quickly minimize their story with the Word of God. We can actually hurt them with the Word of God. So be very humble and careful when you wield the Word of God with someone who's sharing their story with you. Speak with humility and be a non-judgmental and very patient listener. Even though sexual trauma may be Satan's greatest weapon against humanity, God's love is greater. And when we embrace that love, when we believe it for ourselves, when we receive it in faith, there is nothing that we cannot overcome, even past sexual trauma. I love what Joseph says in um, Genesis 50:20. And this is to his brothers who nearly killed him, threw him in a pit, sold him to slavery, into slavery um, to the Egyptians, completely ruined his life, or so they thought. He gets an opportunity at a later point to see them again, and he says something that I'm going to paraphrase for us all. Genesis 50, 20 says, What the enemy intended to harm us with, God can use for our good in order to accomplish his greatest pur greater purpose in us. And that is the truth. Thank you so much for listening to me and for being here. And I look forward to meeting you at the resource table. Wow, well, we did it. We made it to the end. Thank you for staying. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here and showing support. Before you leave today, um, I wanted to let you know there's a stapled copy on, I think it's to the table on the right. We'll hand it out to you. I want to make sure everybody gets a copy. It's an introduction to all the speakers and their resources, and it also talks about the Bible study that is going to happen online with Crystal and in person here on Thursday nights starting on May 11th. Um, also on a table to the right, you'll see Ashley, and she does the darkness to light training. And that is training that will prepare and equip you if anyone ever comes to you and say that, says that they've been sexually abused. You'll know how to handle it. You'll know what to look for. It just creates a greater awareness to protect children and to help others. And so if you are interested in signing up for that training, all you have to do is give her your information, and we will have a date scheduled and get in touch with you and make that available. If anyone has any questions, the speakers are going to be out in the foyer and we'll be happy to answer them for you. I'm going to close this in prayer and then we'll head out. Thank you so much. Please feel free to eat the carbs. <laughs> Dear God, thank you for shining your light today, Lord. I thank you so much for just giving us this opportunity. I thank you for the women and the men who showed up today. And Lord, I know that by the time we even walk out to the car, you'll have already placed someone on our heart to contact and say, Go tomorrow. Go tomorrow. Come hear it. You can do it. Lord, bring the people that you've intended to hear this message. God, I pray that you would just give us a sense of urgency. If we have to go pick them up ourselves and bring them, God, I pray that you would make a way. Thank you for this time. Lord, thank you so much for your goodness to us and for giving us the courage and the strength to share your goodness with others. It's in your name we pray. Amen. And I also just want to give a shout out to Betty. She was the lady that was screaming, Melissa, Melissa. She said, you're raising me, Betty. <laughs> Don't give up on people like me that look at you and say, I didn't come here to make friends. <laughs> like, thank goodness she kept pursuing me. Thank you, Betty. Love you. Love you.